Sam Nelson is on his way to see his wife, Marcia. He is boarding the Kingdom Airlines A330 flight from Dubai to London. We are unsure whether they are divorced or not, but they are separated, and Marcia is now with another man Daniel. Sam and Marcia's son is with her. Sam's chat reveals that he is coming to resolve issues, but he has no idea that he is about to face a much bigger issue, one that will require more than just love and understanding. It will require skills. The scene inside the flight is just like one can imagine, little kids making a racket as their parents try to figure out where to put all the luggage, an elderly husband trying to bribe the cabin crew so that his wife can be more comfortable in the business class, a young couple in all its sweetness, the pilots Captain Robin Allen and First Officer Anna Kovacs having some fun with their guide at Dubai Traffic Control, Arthur of the cabin crew joking with Colette, his co-worker, who is having an affair with Allen, and more. After the flight takes off, Naomi, a young lady who is traveling with her friends, finds a bullet in the lavatory. This is very unusual, and since she has no idea what to make of it, she shows it to another man, who introduces himself as Marcus and says he's going to speak to the captain about it. But that's not the truth. He goes and meets another guy, Stuart, and it is decided that whatever they are planning has to be brought forward. This is when we realize that the bullet belongs to them, and God knows how many more are involved. Nelson notices this conversation but has no reason to think that they are talking about a hijack. One has to be paranoid to think like that. Marcus, whose real name is Terry, then puts on a cap that seems to be the green signal for his team to execute their plan. Nelson also notices wash bags being handed around and finds out that the airline doesn't provide wash bags. Terry tells Naomi and her friends Mona and Casey that, as per the cabin crew, someone dropped the bullet during a security check. However, Mona isn't satisfied with the answer and calls one of the cabin crew, Arthur, only to find out that he has no idea about any bullets. Terry notices this and realizes they need to act before the crew does. Within a few minutes, Terry, Stuart, and many others pull out their guns. The plane is thus hijacked. Nelson remains unusually calm and texts Marcia about the situation. He also reassures her that he is coming home soon. But how? There's surely more to him than meets the eye. Once the passengers and the crew are taken care of, and the hijackers take away all the electronic gadgets from the passengers, Stuart knocks on the cockpit door. Alan confirms with his Dubai counterpart about a security incident, which is just surreal to me. A security incident? Is this the lingo that the pilot is supposed to speak in when there is a man with a gun roaming around the plane? Is this so that there isn't any panic? A security incident is when someone brings a knife onto the plane or when there is a fist fight. When a person is holding a gun, just report that there is a person on the plane with a gun. Either this or I'm just prone to panic. Maybe they should just go and ask the person if he wants to hijack the plane, or did he just forget to check in his gun. It just blows me away to think how people are scared to mention the word terrorist on a plane, especially Americans and the Britishers. This is what happens when you try to avoid raising the alarm. Remember when, in due date, Zach Galifianakis Ethan mentioned terrorist to Robert Downey Jr.'s Peter on the flight and both just got arrested? I find that ludicrous. Anyway, coming back to hijack, Stuart needs to take control of the cockpit so that the plane can be maneuvered towards whichever location they intend to take it to. He uses Colette as bait because he knows that Alan, the captain, and she are having an affair. Anna can see Alan's spirit breaking, and he ultimately unlocks the door after hitting Anna and breaking her nose when she tries to stop him. It's only natural for him to do that. Whether one person's life matters more than a hundred is a question that isn't for a human to answer. Alan then has to report back to the Dubai authorities that the security concern was a false alarm, but the guy he is speaking to isn't convinced. We see this later as well when he speaks to his colleague. While he says that he is relieved, his expression says otherwise. But what can he really do from there for a flight that has already left Dubai airspace? Meanwhile, a female baggage handler at the Dubai airport from which the A330 flight took off, receives a call from her husband who sounds distressed. Their daughter can be heard screaming in the background. She rushes back home and finds that there's no one there. Is she involved in the hijack? Did the hijackers use her to get on the plane with the guns in return for her family's lives? We can't tell for sure. Nelson is keeping his cool. He even stops a couple of guys from taking on the hijackers because he doesn't want to make the situation worse. The passengers have already been given a warning in the form of a note read by one of the air hostesses. For now, the hijackers are calm, but if someone tries to act smart, one doesn't know if they won't pull their triggers. Back in London, Daniel is told by Nelson's son and Marcia that Nelson is hired by big companies during takeovers, mergers, and anything of the sort. 
As per Marsha, he is the best at handling negotiations. Hijack episode 1 ends with Nelson slowly leaving his seat and approaching Stuart. He is ready to make an offer, an offer to help the assailants. So now we know why Nelson is so calm. It is his job to negotiate. No offense, but the hijackers look amateurish, and their only weapon is their guns. Nelson's weapon, which is considered the greatest there ever was in the history of human evolution, is his brain. What is the offer that he is willing to make? And what does he mean when he tells Stuart that he wants to help them? Things are just starting to pick up speed on board the A330 flight, and there's a long way to go. Sam's nightmare comes true when the two guys who he had stopped earlier take another chance at grabbing one of the terrorists, Jaden, and almost succeed. Sam even manages to grab a gun and point it at Stuart, and we can see the fear in his eyes, the fear of death, the fear that every passenger is carrying inside them. While Sam returns the gun to him because all he wants is to go home safely, it is clear that he knows that Stuart is vulnerable. He is afraid of dying. Daniel calls up a woman named Zara, who happens to be his ex. She is a detective chief inspector at the Counterterrorism Command. Their apparent companionship is only due to the fact that they once were together. And that is why, when Daniel asks her for help concerning the situation that he is in, she agrees. She calls up her friend at CTC, who then contacts Air Traffic Control Supervisor Simon at Heathrow, London, who reaches out to the Dubai ATC supervisor, who confirms that the security incident was a false alarm. The message is sent down the chain to Zara, who informs Daniel. Daniel calls Marsha up and gives her the good news. She and her son are both relieved. They couldn't be farther from the truth. From the way Sam has been speaking, Stuart ends up listening to him, if not trusting him. So when he notifies Stuart that the pilot, Robin, might pose a problem, we know that Stuart will consider it, and he does. But what is Sam after here? The plane is on autopilot, which means all Robin has to do is set the course, and it will take the plane anywhere he wants it to. Stuart checks this with Robin, trying to understand how autopilot works, and then brings him out of the cockpit. This seems to be Sam's move to speak to Robin. With him in the cockpit, he is unreachable. But if he is sitting in a passenger seat, he is reachable. How? Via the video game on the seatback screens that are a part of the in-flight entertainment. In the chat, Robin informs Sam that there has been no contact with the ground authorities yet. And since they are about to enter Iraqi airspace, if Iraqi ATC doesn't get any response from the captain, it will scramble military jets, and no one knows what the result will be. If they get no response at all, it will be a threat, and they might just shoot the plane down. So, when the Iraqi ATC contacts Flight KA-29, Stuart, with Sam's help and a bit of struggle, forces Robin, against his wishes, to speak back. But the time taken between the first contact and the captain's confirmation is a bit too long for the Iraq ATC to not doubt that something is wrong. However, they have to make do with Robin's confirmation. As per Sam, Stuart wanted Iraq to scramble the jets so that the hijack situation could be handled. But it would have made things go from bad to worse. While this makes sense for Stuart, we realize that all of it was just a distractive stunt for Sam and Robin to do something else, something that Stuart and his team could never realize. While speaking to Iraq ATC, Robin shifted the course of the plane. This is a distress signal for anyone tracking the flight. We hope that some hijacker isn't tracking it from the ground. That wouldn't be good. But who else can receive the signal? Alice Sinclair arrives late at the ATC in Heathrow, London because she has had to drop her son off at alternative childcare. She learns about the security incident reported by KA-29 and the false alarm and finds it weird. She convinces Simon that somebody on board contacting them via the counter-terrorism command is highly unlikely to be a false alarm. On top of that, there was no more contact because the Wi-Fi inside the flight was off. Simon too reassesses it in his head and, after double-checking with Dubai, calls up Iraq ATC. They share KA-29's path in real time, which reveals that the plane has shifted its course by 3 degrees. This is the plane telling them that something is wrong and reaching out for help. So, this is what Sam and Captain Robin Allen pulled off in their scripted grapple. They managed to send a message to whoever was watching that they needed help. Had it not been for Alice, the small shift wouldn't have been noticed by anyone. Clearly, Alice is someone who has been in the aviation sector for a long time, and Simon trusts her instincts. Her doubts make her an expert in her field. Had it not been for her, they wouldn't have noticed the shift because it was too small and had to be zoomed in. Among all the people involved in the chain of communication mentioned above, it is only the guy at Dubai ATC from Episode 1, Abdullah, who is doubtful about Flight KA-29. He doesn't want to waste any more time being indecisive, 
so he decides to find out whatever he can that might give him some answers. He reaches out to the security staff to look at the CCTV footage at the check-in counters. He sees Neela, the baggage handler, speaking to someone on the phone before leaving, although it is unsure whether her shift is over. On his way home, airport security informs him that Neela left early after calling in sick, which is unusual because she didn't appear sick at all. She was in quite a hurry. He decides to meet her. Upon arriving at her home, he finds a couple of British cleaners who direct him upstairs to where Neela and her husband are. Abdullah heads upstairs and calls out, but there's no reply. He heads inside the bathroom and finds the couple shot to death. Hijack episode 2 ends with Abdullah being shot in the head by one of the cleaners. So, it seems that the network of hijackers isn't as small as it initially seemed. They have people taking care of every last bit of evidence that can be traced back to them. With Abdullah, the two cleaners have to get rid of the bodies and wipe the whole room clean so that not even a single strand of hair can be recovered from the spot. How big is the network of the hijackers? What will be Sam's next move? Stuart has started to believe him, which is a good sign. And the shift should have made the ground authorities aware that something is wrong, at least, that's what Sam and Robin think. But they do not know that they are right to think so. This is just the beginning. The English law enforcement authorities and the air traffic control center needed to find a lot of information to be fully aware of the situation before the plane landed in their country. Meanwhile, Sam Nelson, together with Robin Allen and others, was trying his best to communicate as much as he could with the ground staff and make them aware of their situation. So let's find out what happened in the third episode of Hijack and what Sam and the other passengers planned on doing. After Alice found out in the previous episode of Hijack that Flight KA-29 was not following the normal route, the Swanick Air Traffic Control Center issued a warning, and other agencies started looking into the matter. Zara Goffer, from the Counterterrorism Department, informed her seniors about the issue and gave them whatever little intel she had on the issue. She told them how the Iraqi Air Control Center had identified some anomalies, and Alice had found substantial evidence through which they could conclude that something was not right on the flight. Zara told her seniors how the pilot had issued a warning, which he later suspiciously withdrew by saying that it was a false alarm. She then told about the message that Sam Nelson had sent to his wife, Marcia, informing her that there had been an incident on the flight. Zara was in touch with Daniel Farrell, as he was the one who had informed her about the message that Sam had sent Marcia. Zara checked if their national database had any information about the 216 passengers, and though she got a hit on one person named John T. Collins, who had been convicted in the past for serious crimes, there was nothing dubious about any other passenger. Zara didn't know what to do next so she sent the passenger names to Daniel to see if he could find anything about them. Daniel found out that there were five people on that plane on whom no information existed in any database, and he was pretty sure that these people were the hijackers. We know that there were five hijackers on the plane, so Daniel is probably right about his speculation. Zara finally got the breakthrough she was looking for, and now the law enforcement agencies were geared up to find more information on these people and ascertain the motive behind their actions. Until now, no call or communication had been made by the hijackers that tell us why they were doing it in the first place. The leader of the hijackers contacted somebody, and we came to know that they, too, were acting on the orders of some people who were probably the masterminds behind the entire charade. It did feel like the hijackers were also quite nervous, and it was probably the first time they were committing a crime of such magnitude. People were getting restless on the flight, and they didn't know if they would ever live to see another day. The hijackers found out that Robin Allen, the pilot, and Sam Nelson had been talking through the game that was installed on their screens. The leader of the hijackers brutally assaulted Robin and then came to Sam Nelson. He asked him to keep smiling otherwise he will hit him with the handle of his gun. The female hijacker pointed a gun toward another passenger, and Sam was told to keep smiling if he didn't want the passenger to get shot. The hijacker didn't hit Sam but the kind of fear and mental torture he went through at that moment made him realize that they were treading on thin ice, and there was no certainty about what the hijacker would do next. They did not have the luxury to waste another minute, and by making the plane take a different route, they tried to inform the ground staff about their situation, but they couldn't depend on that and needed to do more. A passenger sitting just behind Sam said that the guns that the terrorists were using were fake. Hugo, the passenger right next to Sam, wanted to take down the hijackers, but Sam told him that it was not a wise thing to do. Sam wanted to be sure before making any move because if it turned out that the speculation was wrong and the guns were real, then there could be dire consequences, and someone might lose their life. But Hugo was restless, 
and he pretended to be sick so that he could go to the washroom and pass a message to the passengers sitting in the economy to look for a bullet on the floor. The hijackers had fired one round earlier, and Hugo was of the opinion that if all they had were black shells, then no bullet would be found on the ground. The passengers did not find any bullets, but Sam still didn't want to act based just on that information. He asked the Egyptian traveler to make a drawing of a fake and real bullet so that he could show it to Naomi, the girl who had found the bullet in the washroom, and she could ascertain if what she found was real or not. Somehow Arthur, the flight attendant, was able to pass the paper to Naomi, who confirmed that the bullet was fake. Sam told Hugo that they would have to take their chances and take down the weakest of the hijackers. He found the old hijacker to be the most vulnerable target and asked Hugo to attack him, but Hugo was too nervous to even move, and he told Sam that he wouldn't be able to do it. So Sam took it upon himself and attacked the old man. At the same time, we saw the leader of the hijackers, who was in the cockpit, loading his gun with what seemed to be actual bullets. It is possible that, though all the guns were fake, there was one that was real. It could have happened that Sam and others were wrong in speculating that the hijacker didn't have real bullets on them. The end of Hijack Episode 3 left us on a cliffhanger as Sam stood in front of the old man and asked him to shoot, presuming that the shells were blank, but just then, he heard a loud bang. The leader of the hijackers saw things getting out of hand, and he went back and shot a lady who had gotten up to look for a little girl named Izzy. Terror could be seen in the eyes of the passengers, as their worst fears were now coming true. The hijackers were not using fake bullets, and Sam Nelson realized that he and others in the business class had committed a blunder. Sam Nelson started thinking of other ways to communicate with the air traffic control center. Meanwhile, the plane had entered Romanian airspace, and they were asking for verifications according to protocol. Captain Robin Allen was sitting in business class, but the leader of the hijackers was in no mood to let him come into the cockpit and reply to them. The leader was under the misconception that since the plane was headed to the UK, the different countries over whose airspace they were flying would let it pass even if they didn't answer according to protocol. But the leader was wrong, as Robin Allen pointed out that for a foreign nation, the plane is like a missile, and if either the government or the pilot didn't provide any information, then they would shoot it down. Meanwhile, the British foreign minister was briefed about the ongoing situation by Zara Goffer, and she made it very clear that unless and until they knew the nationality of the hijackers, they would not respond to any other nations. The foreign minister was constantly being contacted by his Romanian counterpart, but she was ignoring those calls as she had no idea what was happening. Alice Sinclair was in touch with the Romanian air traffic controllers, and she got to know that there were military jets flying side by side with the hijacked plane. Alice had been unable to convince her Romanian counterpart, and they had said that they were going ahead and shooting the planes down. Meanwhile, on the plane, Robin Allen told the hijackers the same thing if they did not respond, then the Romanian planes were going to shoot them down. When the hijackers realized that what he was saying might be true, they let him enter the cockpit so that he could follow the protocol. But Robin found out that the microphone was broken and there was no way to communicate with the Romanian Air Traffic Control Center. Sam Nelson saw that one of the younger male hijackers was severely injured and was losing a lot of blood. Sam was an intelligent man and he had been in pressure situations before and so he knew that he needed to control his emotions and try to manipulate his opponent. He knew that he had to win the trust of the hijackers, so he led them into conflicts where they ended up giving out information without realizing the damage they had done. He started talking to the injured hijacker and told him that he needed to get a doctor so that the bleeding could stop. The air hostess was trying to wrap a bandage around his wound, but Sam told her that she needed another man to help since she was not able to do it properly. Sam knew that the injured hijacker would get desperate if the threat seemed real, and he actually started entertaining the possibility of death. The hijacker was losing confidence with every passing second, and he was entering a space, psychologically speaking, where he just wanted somebody to save his life. He asked Sam to call Terry, but Sam lied that he couldn't see anybody. He asked the injured hijacker to uncuff him so that he could help. The hijacker agreed, and Sam quickly came and sat down near him. He started manipulating him, and the hijacker reached a point where he was no longer in control. He told Sam that he wanted to call his mother one last time and say something to her. Sam knew that he would never get this kind of opportunity where a phone with an active internet connection was given to him. Sam called his wife Marcia and while she was on the phone he somehow managed to give her the hijacker's mother's phone number. As soon as Marcia got this information, she called Daniel and told her everything. 
Daniel knew that the number Sam had spoken on the phone was for a reason, and he immediately put it in the national database to find out who it belonged to. Daniel's team found out that it belonged to the Adderton family, and the number led them to find the details about other hijackers as well. Meanwhile, the Romanian foreign secretary, who was continuously in touch with his British counterpart, told her that in the next 60 seconds, they were going to shoot the plane down. The tensions rose, and everybody sat there holding their breaths. Just then, a list was sent directly to the British foreign secretary in which the names of the hijackers and their basic details were given. Lewis and Stuart Adderton, Jamie Constantino, Terry Reid, and Jaden Deheer were the names of the five hijackers who were on the plane. The British foreign minister confirmed to Romania that the plane was headed to the United Kingdom and that the hijackers were all British nationals. The attack was called off by the Romanian government, and though there was still a long way to go, this little victory allowed all those who were involved to take a sigh of relief as the lives of hundreds of innocents were saved. Episode 4 ending left us on a cliffhanger as two important developments took place that caught our attention. A minister was given a folder that had the word, demands, written on it, and we believe that the hijackers have probably decided to let the government know what their motive behind hijacking the plane was. Also, we think that the demand wasn't made by the hijackers on the plane but by the masterminds operating from the ground, though still, we don't know anything about their whereabouts. The second thing that happened was that Marsha received a call from a stranger who identified himself as a delivery man and asked for Sam Nelson's address. Marsha didn't know who they were or what package they wanted to deliver, but when she reached home at the end of the episode, she didn't find her son in the house. It could be a possibility that those two men on the delivery truck might have received orders to kidnap the family members of Sam Nelson, just like they had done in Dubai. We would like to wait for the next episode to find out who these delivery men were, on whose orders they were acting, and if Sam Nelson's exceptional negotiation skills are able to save the day. The Home Minister had no clue what was happening on Flight KA-29, and he called the Foreign Secretary, Lousy, to ask what she knew about the issue. The Home Minister went straight to the Counterterrorism Department, where the Foreign Secretary was having a meeting with Zara and others. The masterminds on whose orders the hijacking was being carried out demanded the release of two convicts, Edgar Jansen and John Bailey Brown, who were currently serving their sentences in some prisons in the UK. The perpetrators threatened that if the English government did not fulfill their demands, then all the 216 passengers on the flight would be killed. The Home Minister made it very clear that unless and until he knew that the perpetrators were actually killing the people, he was not going to adhere to their demands. Meanwhile, in Dubai, Neela's neighbors got suspicious, and they informed the police that something was not right in their neighborhood. Neela was the same woman who had been coerced by the perpetrators to let their men board the British flight with weapons. Later, when she went to her house, she was killed by the two men disguised as cleaners. The police came, and the woman living in the neighboring house told them everything she knew. She had seen the cleaners leaving, and her intuition told her that something was definitely not right. The police went inside and found out that Neela's entire family had been murdered, and soon, the news got out and was covered by the various local media houses. One of the people in Zara Goffer's department saw it online and informed everybody about it. The Home Minister got the evidence he needed, and now he knew that the masterminds of the hijacking were capable of killing the passengers on board. Daniel O'Farrell had found out the address of Lewis and Stewart's mother by tracking the call that had been made from the flight. He started his interrogation, hoping that she would give him some details about the hijackers, but Elaine Adderton blatantly told Daniel that she wouldn't be able to help his cause. Elaine was petrified of the people who were behind the hijacking, as time and again, she told Daniel that she was not doing this willingly. Elaine told Daniel that her husband, Peter, had been killed by these people because Lewis, her son, had not followed their orders. One thing that came out of this entire scene was that the hijackers were as petrified as the passengers. Stuart Adderton and his team were told what they were supposed to do and what would happen if they failed to follow the orders and acted smart. The kind of stress the hijackers were under was quite evident by looking at them, and that is why Sam Nelson was able to take advantage of the situation and play with their minds. Elaine told Daniel that these people would come after her and probably after him too. Elaine went inside the room to bring tissues and took the opportunity to escape from the house. Elaine frantically ran to the highway and was probably run over by a vehicle, while Daniel and his colleagues stood there as mere onlookers. This act by Elaine made us realize how dangerous these people were. Even before they said anything, Elaine got so paranoid that she gave up her life. Meanwhile, on the flight, Sam Nelson devised another plan after he realized that Anna Corvax belonged to Hungary and the plane was soon going over its airspace. Sam Nelson was an observant man, 
and because he was such an exceptional negotiator, he held his cards till the very last moment and never let the other party know what was going on inside his mind. He saw the flag of Hungary on Anna Kovac's badge, and he drew it on a piece of paper and asked his fellow passengers which country it belonged to. Once he got to know about it, he got up and told Stuart that they needed to land the plane in Hungary as Lewis desperately needed medical assistance. Sam had figured out that Lewis and Stuart were brothers, and he knew that Stuart would do anything to save him. The doctor had told Stuart that Lewis' condition was stable, but Sam told him that he was lying because he didn't want to reveal the actual state of things. Stuart knew how manipulative Sam was, so he told him that he would ask the doctor himself. Sam and Stuart were having this conversation near the business class, and the doctor had no clue about it. In reality, Lewis' condition was actually stable, but Sam wanted the plane to land at Gyurper Airport so that the local forces could intervene. Sam knew that there was a phone in the compartment where the doctor was standing and where Lewis lay on the floor. Sam told Divya Khan, the air hostess, to immediately call and tell him that he had to say less than one hour to whatever Stuart was going to ask him. The time was so short that Divya was not able to give any kind of context to the doctor, and Sam knew that his plan would backfire if the doctor told the truth. But luckily, the doctor understood the signal and told Stuart that Lewis had less than an hour. Sam had already told Anna Kovacs to talk to Hungarian air traffic control in her native language so that the hijacker wouldn't understand what she said. Terry, Jamie, and Jaden were against the flight landing, and they vehemently asked Stuart not to do so. But Stuart was adamant, and he was not ready to listen to anybody because the life of his brother was at stake. Towards the end of the hijack, Sam got to know about something that changed his mind, and he asked Anna Kovacs not to land in Hungary. Terry took Sam aside and told him that the people who were pulling the reins were extremely dangerous, and they could hurt the families of not only the hijackers but Sam Nelson's as well. Terry told Sam that they had given his passport details to their bosses, as they were told to do so in case anyone tried to act smart. Terry told the same story that earlier Elaine had told Daniel about how Lewis had refused to carry out their orders and the bosses had decided to kill his father. Terry said that he was the one who was asked to kill Lewis' father, and that is why he knew what they were capable of doing. Sam Nelson wanted to save the lives of the passengers, but he was not ready to put his family at risk. Even Lewis, in that state, murmured that they should not land, and Sam realized that if a man who was on the verge of dying was saying that he didn't want to be cured, then the people who were running the show were actually quite capable of destroying anybody's life. Lewis died in the end, and Sam told Stuart that he had taken out that pen himself, though we have doubts about it. Sam said that Lewis gave his life so that Stuart didn't feel the need to land, but we believe that it is possible that Sam himself took out that pen so that he could convince Stuart. The two men who had asked for Sam's address from Marsha in the previous episode of Hijack reached Sam's house. Sam's son was in his house at that time, and because he saw them taking out their guns, he hid inside the bedroom. We will get to know in the next episode if they were able to find Sam's son or not. In the sixth episode of Hijack, the British authorities realized that they had no other option other than agreeing to the demands made by the hijackers and releasing Edgar Jansen and John Bailey Brown from prison. The strategy was that they were going to slowly try to buy as much time as they could so that they had a better understanding of what was happening. Meanwhile, Sam Nelson kept on using his skills and in influencing Stuart, but neither Sam nor the five hijackers knew what was going to happen next and were just depending on their instincts. A man named Devlin gave a call to Felix Staten, a journalist, and asked him to meet him immediately if he wanted a big scoop. Devlin told Felix that the shares of Kingdom Airlines and Macmillan Doyle Insurance Company were going to collapse very soon as flight KA-29 was hijacked. We believe that Devlin was surely going to benefit from this entire deal, and he told Felix that the market should get to know about it in the next 30 minutes or he should be ready to face the consequences. We don't know if Devlin was working for Edgar or not, but after Felix left, he did give a call to some unknown person and told him that the work had been done. Maybe just getting Edgar Jansen and John Bailey Brown out of prison was not the only thing that these people wanted to do, and there was a bigger picture that, until now, nobody had been able to see. Devlin knew about what Felix had done in the past. Felix had been involved in a scam involving insider trading, and up until then, nobody knew about it. Devlin threatened Felix that if the news wasn't out immediately, it wouldn't take him long to bring his corrupt practices to light. Felix tweeted about the hijacking of a Kingdom Airlines flight, and soon people got to know about it. Neil and Louise, back at the counter-terrorism headquarters, didn't know how it had happened, and they realized that if they did not act quickly now, the hijackers might get the better of them. Neil might have said earlier that they would comply with the demands of the hijackers, but in reality, he had no intention of doing that. 
There was an additional tracker planted inside the car that was driven by Edgar Jansen and John Bailey Brown, apart from the one installed on their phones. Edgar dropped the phone midway when he realized that he was being followed by Daniel. He stopped his car, came to Daniel, and told him that if he got to know that his movements were being tracked or that he was being followed by police officers, he would order his men to start killing the passengers on board. Edgar encountered a roadblock, and he lost his temper. He called Daniel and told him that if he didn't get it removed, then people would die, and he would have only himself to blame for it. Daniel tried convincing Zara and others, but they wanted to go ahead with their plan. Edgar turned his car around and took an off-road that went through a farm and connected to the adjoining highway. Zara and others were able to ascertain that both convicts were going to the nearest airport, where a chartered flight was waiting for them. Now they didn't want Edgar and John Bailey to escape before the hijacked flight landed in London. That's why they were trying to block their way and make sure that they were somehow stuck on land. Edgar's car reached the airport, and the commandos present there surrounded them on all sides. But to their horror, Edgar Jansen and John Bailey Brown were not in the car, and they had somehow managed to get down midway and change vehicles. Edgar had taken that off-road intentionally, as there was already a car parked there for him and his companion. They took that car, and now, nobody knew where they were or what they were up to. In dangerous situations like the one that happened on Flight KA-29, we often feel that the perpetrators have everything under control and that we are the ones who are having the panic attacks. But time and again, Sam Nelson proved that if one acted smartly in these situations, they could get the better of the criminals. At the end of the day, even the hijackers were human beings, and they also felt like relying on somebody who they could trust. Sam Nelson had already won their trust, and now he was in a position to tell them how to go about things. Edgar Jansen and John Bailey Brown had been released from prison, and they had explicitly told the police officers not to follow them. Zara Goffer had asked Daniel and Erica to keep track of their movements, as she somehow undermined their authority and what they were capable of doing. Edgar contacted Stewart on the flight and asked him to kill one passenger and send in the image so that he could show the police officers that he meant business. Stewart didn't want to kill anyone, and Sam knew about it, so he took his chances, got up, and told Stewart that he didn't have to because he had a way out. The hijackers had already killed a woman earlier, and Sam managed to convince Stewart to send her picture, as Edgar had no way of knowing that she had not been killed right now. Stewart did that, but Sam knew that at any moment, another demand of such sort would be made, and the hijackers would be compelled to shoot and kill another person. Sam realized that there was no other way, and they would have to wage an all-out attack on the hijackers and take the plane under their control. Sam circulated an empty bottle after marking a tagline written on it that said, get ready to shake things up. When Edgar encountered a roadblock, he asked Daniel to immediately get it removed if he didn't want another passenger to die. Zara's plan was that she would somehow stop Edgar Jansen and John Bailey Brown from reaching their destination until the time flight KA-29 landed in London. But Edgar was in a hurry, and he took an off route while telling Daniel that now the blood of another innocent passenger was on his hands. Edgar once again messaged Stewart to do the needful, and an observant Sam realized that the time had come. Stewart pointed a gun at Sam, but Divya Khan, the air hostess, came at the right moment and convinced Stewart not to kill him, as he had tried to save his brother's life. Stewart started shouting frantically, and he told them that one of the passengers would volunteer to be shot. Stewart didn't know what he was doing, and it was as if he had gotten an anxiety attack. Sam and other passengers took down the hijackers one by one. Sam confronted Stewart and asked him to give him his gun, as he knew that it was the only gun with actual bullets on the plane. But Sam was extremely wrong, as, like Zara, he had also underestimated what Edgar was capable of. Apart from the five hijackers that everybody knew about, there were at least two more people on the plane who were with Edgar Jansen and John Bailey Brown. Seeing the situation get out of hand, a woman named Amanda got up from her seat and went directly to the restroom. She took the gun that was kept there, came out, and dashed towards the cockpit. Without even batting an eye, she shot Robin Allen point-blank and locked the door of the cockpit behind her. Sam realized that a bigger problem was at hand, as even the hijackers didn't know who these people were. They had about an hour before they landed, and Sam knew that if he didn't do anything about it, none of them would be saved. The first season of Hijack came to an end, and after the tensions continued to soar high throughout the first six episodes, we finally got to know the motive behind the hijacking. Sam Nelson took the initiative, he tackled the situation at hand and used his negotiating skills to get leverage on the hijackers. It wouldn't be wrong to say that Sam became the difference between life and death for the passengers, and he was able to do much more than what the entire counterterrorism wing was able to achieve. Sam was always a step ahead since the very beginning, and he had faith in himself, 
which didn't let him lose his nerves even in the most pressurizing situations. So, let's find out what happened in the hijack season finale and if Sam Nelson was able to save the lives of all the passengers aboard. The amount of stress that each and every British official was feeling could be ascertained by looking at their petrified faces while they sat together and tried to decipher how they could deal with the problem at hand. Neil Walsh, the Home Secretary, had started entertaining the possibility that they would have to shoot down the plane, but the Foreign Minister, Louise, was totally against it. She was not ready to let her people die, even though she didn't know what the probable cause of action would be if the hijackers decided to crash the plane. Alice Sinclair told them that the plane had once again changed course and was probably going to crash or land in central London. Neil Walsh told Louise that he would take the fall for it if anything went wrong, but she had to agree that they would have to shoot the plane because, for him, the picture was very clear, and it was the lives of 216 passengers against the hundreds of people staying in central London. Neil Walsh knew that he would have to bear the consequences of letting two of the most wanted criminals go free but if the citizens were also killed, then matters would get worse. Neil was actually not wrong here, as it was a huge gamble, but Louise just couldn't overlook what her conscience was telling her. For a moment, it felt like Louise would give in, but at the very last moment, she had a change of heart, and she decided that no matter what anybody said, she would not give up hope and would fight till the very last moment, even if it put her entire career in jeopardy. Louise told the Prime Minister that they were trying to negotiate with the hijackers and were not going to shoot them down. Meanwhile, we got to know what the terrorists, Edgar Jansen and John Bailey Brown, were up to. Neil Walsh and Louise were informed by the intelligence agency officials that the intention of the terrorists was not exactly to hijack the plane, but they were trying to achieve something very different. The terrorists were trying to deploy an unscrupulous strategy, which in the financial world was known as a bear raid. They had hijacked the plane so that the share prices of Kingdom Airlines started dipping, and they knew that once they had reached their lowest, they would buy shares and earn huge amounts of money in a quick time. The plan was that once the terrorists made the trade, they would send the message to the pilot, Amanda, and tell her to safely land the plane. But Edgar Jansen had different plans, and he wanted to really stretch the limit and wait for the time when the share prices were at their lowest. He knew the lower the share prices went, the greater the profit they were going to make. John Bailey was against this, and he told Edgar he was taking unnecessary risks by being greedy. Edgar's plan was to get the plane crashed and earn maximum revenue, and he was way too stubborn to give in and listen to John Bailey. That's when John Bailey decided that it was best for them to kill Edgar and end the hassle. John told his henchmen to shoot Edgar, and in a split second, Edgar Jansen was lying on the ground in a pool of blood. We don't know where John went after that or why he only targeted Kingdom Airlines, and probably these questions would be dealt with in Hijack Season 2 if there is one. Daniel, in the sixth episode of The Hijack, realized that these terrorists and hijackers were very dangerous people and were capable of taking extreme measures to make sure that their plan was a success. After Edgar and John tricked him and went their way, he once again gave a call to Zara Goffer and told her to follow their instructions because they were quite capable of crashing the plane. Daniel called Marcia and intuitively asked her if anything suspicious had happened to her in the past couple of days. Marcia suddenly remembered that she had gotten a call from a delivery man who was asking her about Sam's address. Daniel knew that something was not right, and he got even more paranoid when he realized that Kai, Marcia's son, was in Sam's house at that moment. Daniel called Kai, and at that time, the men who were working for the terrorists had put a gun to his head. Kai, in the previous episode of The Hijack, had been able to inform the police that two men had broken into his father's house and that his life was in danger. When the police came, the hired guns were able to tackle the situation and make the officer believe that nothing was wrong there. One of them had caught Kai, and the poor boy was petrified and didn't know what to do. When Kai was on a call with Daniel, he realized that he had to give him some signal through which he would realize that he was not safe. He told Daniel that he would come back home on his bike, and instantly, Daniel realized that the boy was trying to tell him that he was not safe since he didn't own a bike. Daniel reached Sam's house with his entire cavalry and took the two hired guns into custody. Daniel had gotten a call from Zara before he arrested the cleaners, and she told him that she had doubts about the involvement of Sam Nelson in the hijacking, but Daniel assured her that Sam was innocent since his family was also being targeted. As much as we would like to see Sam Nelson as the hero who saved the lives of those passengers, Zara's suspicion could not be discarded as of now because there was a lot of ambiguity about what Sam did in real life, and probably the veil would be lifted if there was a season 2. Sam knew that he had to get inside the cockpit and convince Amanda not to do anything stupid and land the plane. Sam Nelson was an excellent negotiator, and it was fascinating to see him influence people and almost make them do what he wanted. 
He did very obvious things, but they turned out to be quite effective. Sam started writing messages on a piece of paper and putting them in front of the camera screen so that Amanda could read them and change her mind. Through Amanda's phone, he got to know that she had a daughter, and she was doing it because the terrorists had threatened to kill her if she didn't act according to their orders. Sam got to know that there was another man on board named Alec who was told by the terrorists to bring a weapon on the plane, and he was the one who had also helped them in some manner with the entire deal. Alec said that it was only about money, and as soon as the bear raid was successful, they were supposed to send a message to Amanda to make a safe landing. Sam was in contact with Alice Sinclair from the Air Traffic Control Center, and she had assured him that she wouldn't let the authorities shoot down the plane and that she would make sure that they made a safe landing. Sam managed to convince Amanda to open the cockpit and let him enter. As soon as Sam was inside, he asked Alice for directions, and together they figured out where they could make a landing. The plane was out of fuel, and there were a lot of other technical issues that made Sam realize that the odds were not in their favor. There was tension in the air, but Sam and Amanda kept their nerves in check and were able to pull off an impossible task and land the plane safely. The passengers took a huge sigh of relief, and the nightmare was finally over. Tears of joy could be seen rolling from everyone's eyes because they knew that they had actually escaped death. Sam forgot a parcel in the cabin, and he went back to take it, which was probably the worst thing he could do. Stuart, the hijacker, had been waiting for him with a loaded gun in his hand. Stuart had resigned himself to his fate, and he knew that he would have to bear the consequences of his actions. His brother had died, and after going through so much, he had lost the will to live. Stuart chased Sam with the intent of putting a bullet in him, but he couldn't. The shrewd negotiator was able to get the better of Stuart, and during hijack's ending, the commandos came in and took charge of the situation. Sam Nelson was alive, and it wouldn't be wrong to say that had he not been there, a lot of things would have gone differently, and the passengers wouldn't have lived to see another day. There are still a lot of things that we do not know about Sam, and we wouldn't be surprised if, in the second season of Hijack, assuming the makers decide to make one, we get to know something that completely changes the dynamics of the situation. Thank you for joining us on this journey. And I hope you enjoyed the Hijack episode. We will meet in the next video.